here's Rick. <laughs> He looks about as old as Johnny Carson, doesn't he? <laughs> that was not good. Anyway, now where'd James go? Did you say James? Yeah, he was standing right back there. There he is. James. Get James if we're waiting right behind. I guess he's on security. Yeah, he was, I, I said I needed a volunteer tonight, and he's been standing back there going like this, so I thought I'd ask him if he'd come up, please. James? James? Come on! You know? So we're... We're going to have a little fun tonight at his expense. I mean, uh, with, with James up here. Okay? So, so James, I got some, some stuff here I'd like you to put on if you would. Yeah. Yeah, would you do that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do that. <laughs> well, at least we know he doesn't have the big head, huh? Anyway. <laughs> so you just... Get that. That's not a diaper, James. <laughs> Go ahead and get that put on. All right. All right. While he's doing that, the rest of you would turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. That's where we're going to be tonight. And uh, But first I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the clothes the cowboy wore and why he wore them. Man, we're going to have to find a smaller preacher to loan you his clothes from now on. <laughs> All right. How you doing there? Who dresses you in the morning? Right, no, wait, 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 wait. You got to unbuckle them. Okay. And then the buckle goes in the back. What? Yep. So you can buckle them in the front and slide them around. Yeah. <laughs> My brother was helping a guy with some cows one day, and they, they had this cow that had sullied up on them, and they got a rope on her and going to pull her, because he'd gotten on the neighbor's place, and going to pull her along there. And, and uh, But she got around a tree, N no. Inside out. Or... Now, now you're inside out. What? I'm sorry, folks. This could take a while. <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah, you do. I mean, yes, they do. Now switch those around to the, to the back. There you go. Okay. Hey, he's coming along good now. But anyway, my brother and this guy were out there, and uh, this cow got wrapped around a tree, and Ron says, "Give me the rope." And he goes and unwraps the tree, and he hands it back to my brother on the horse. But right as he reaches up, that cow took off. Ron wouldn't let her go. He's holding on to that cow. And he's a little short guy anyway. And about 20 steps, his shafts were right around his knee. And he was running like this, <laughs> trying to keep up with that cow. Then he went down. And she drug him right through a cat claw. Then he let go of the rope. My brother said, why didn't you let go before then? I couldn't. I just couldn't bear the thought that she was best in me. 
So how you doing here? You're doing good. That's good. All right. Yes, because it's not boots. Yeah. Yeah, it's harder when it's not boots. Yeah, no, that's all right. We're, we're going to have to move on, James. <laughs> all right. So come right over here. Let her, let her make it look at it. <laughs> Yeah, if I wore them like that, they'd make me walk funny, too. <laughs> all right. The one thing I wanted you to notice, what did he put on first? That's the true cowboy. Yeah. So... And at least it's not like this. Yeah, yeah. He, he did it right. So, so, this is the hat. The hat had a purpose. Now, if he was a vaquero, a Mexican cowboy, what would this be? Sombrero. sombrero. Why do they call it a sombrero? Sombra is the Spanish word for shade. And sombrero, a literal interpretation, is shader. So their hat was a shader. And a lot of the old-time cowboys, that's what they called their hats, was shaders. The American cowboys. So the hat had a purpose. It wasn't just to look cool. If you notice, it's got a... <laughs> hey, could you guys be quiet down there? This... <laughs> The hat kept the sun off, kept the rain off. It, it, it had a purpose. It, it gives you a little padding when you're going through the brush and stuff. The limbs and stuff hit. It's not quite as hard as if you didn't have anything up there helping you. So, so the hat was protective. Okay, once you understand that, it was protective. His scarf. The bandana had, had many uses. And so, <laughs> yeah, it was used like that. Honestly, it was used like that to keep the dust out if you're riding drag. And a lot of them used silk for their scarves. Now, this was one area the cowboy could uh, flourish a little bit here and make himself look a little extra special because they'd get special cloth and stuff, uh, prints and stuff for their scarves to dress them up. He looks good, doesn't he? I tell you. <laughs> Does somebody else want to do this for a while? <laughs> there you go. So, uh, so this was used. It would keep the dust out, help keep the sun off your neck. And that hat does that too, keeps that sun off your neck. And then uh, you could use it to wipe the sweat. Uh, you could use it to wash your horse's nostrils out. That's what I used it for last. <laughs> and uh, that's it. Will you take that home and wash it when we're done? Thank you. Anyway, the fact is that it was a useful piece of the clothing. A cowboy didn't wear anything just because it was cool. So the vest. If you notice, the vest has pockets. And most of the vests were canvas. There were some that were leather. But the vest was protective too. When you're riding through the brush and the thorns, that's an extra layer. It's an extra layer against the sun. It's an extra layer against the rain. But it has pockets. When you're on horseback, you can't get in your pockets. So you could carry a lot of things in, in the vest pocket. Uh, a knife, you carry a tally book and a little pencil. Uh, all kinds of things you could put in those vest pockets that you could get to easily. So it was functionality. It was protection. The, the, and I'm glad you wore a long sleeve shirt tonight. You, you didn't see cowboys in short sleeve shirts. Because in short sleeve shirts, everything scratches and scrapes you. And the sun will eat you alive when you're out there for eight hours in that sun. So it was protection. When, when I was growing up, we lived in farming country, and it wasn't quite as bad as here with the sun. And people talk about a farmer's tan. 
And a lot of the farmers would wear a short sleeve and you pull it up, they're just white as could be here or they'd take off their ball cap and they got a line across here where they're white up here and just brown as they can be below that. And here they call it a cowboy tan. You'll see cowboys, their hands will be very tan. And if you pull their sleeve up, just white and silky, creamy white because they never get any sun on it. But the shirt, again, was protective. Now remember, back in the day, shirts didn't have pockets. That, that's a newer innovation. Back in the 1800s, the shirts didn't have pockets. And so uh, the vest helped by having those extra pockets on it. Then their pants were usually a canvas pants because of the toughness of them. They needed, uh, they're gonna be riding in that saddle day in, day out, and they needed pants that would hold up. And they're, you going somewhere? No, okay. <laughs> and uh, so they wore canvas pants, and they could take those canvas pants, they could take them into the stream and wash them out and hang them up, and, and they would stand there by themselves while you jumped into them. And then the shaps. The shaps were for protection from the brush and the thorns. They were also for protection from the rope. And they were also protection for your legs because rubbing against that leather saddle all day can really make you sore. So they were used that way. And, and when you rope something and you're gonna turn and drag that calf, that rope's gonna be held here and come right across there. If you don't have that leather, it's gonna hurt you. So the shaps were a protective. The spurs were a tool. Yeah. He's got them on upside down, but we're not counting that. Anyway. Those are ankle shaps, by the way. And so uh, the spurs were a tool. We see the guys just jab their horses and go, cowboys didn't do that because that horse has to carry you. Your horse was like today buying your Corvette. You're gonna treat that like a baby and take care of it because that's your transportation, it's all you got. And so they took care of their horses. But with a spur, you can use a, horse, you can use a spur gently on a horse and make him do about anything you want him to do. I can make him walk sideways. Even a horse that's not been trained if you know how to use the spurs, you make them just step sideways, leg over leg like that, just by using a spur. So they're, they're very useful tool. Then the boots, which he doesn't have. But cowboy boots, they don't have the slanted heel to look cool. Those are called a dogger heel, and it's, it's because the, the height of it was to keep it from going through the stirrup. Because if you get a foot caught through the stirrup, you can be drugged and killed. So they didn't want their feet to go through the stirrup. So they had to have a higher heel. And then the slanted heel, the dogger heel, was for the... You can go ahead and start getting undressed. It'll take you forever. Anyway. <laughs> the dogger heel was for groundwork. Because if you got a flat-heeled shoe like he's got on now, and you got a calf on a rope, you're branding and stuff, you're trying to hold that, that flat heel just pushes your foot down and they'll just drag you. But with the dogger heel, it cuts into the earth like that and gives you a brace against that calf. So everything was for a purpose. And we look around today and we see everybody wearing boots and stuff. Cowboys didn't... <laughs> Cowboy boots are not the most comfortable thing to wear day in and day out. They aren't. That's why cowboys, if he was in the drugstore and wanted to go to the diner, he'd get on his horse and ride him across the street. They didn't walk anywhere. So it's uh, everything they had, they wore for the purpose. A majority of it was for their protection. Part of it was to be able to do the job that they had to do. Now let's go to, to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to go down to verse 13. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. 
And it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. I want you to get that. He's saying to take the whole armor of God, because at the end of the day, they want you standing. When you got into battle, that's my hat, brother. <laughs> With a cowboy, you can kick his dog and slap his wife, but don't touch his hat. Okay, just so you understand that. Thank you, James. Let's give him a hand. So at the end of the day, God's desire is that you would come through every trial and every situation that you face that day still on your feet. Standing. Being able to stand and face tomorrow. Because you're going to get up tomorrow and do it all again. I mean, that's the way life is. Today may have been pretty easy. Tomorrow may be rough or it may be easier. But with each day, you have certain things that you're going to have to face. And God wants you to be able to stand. So he says, take the whole armor of God. And he starts out here. He says, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Man, if you're going to be an effective witness for the Lord Jesus Christ... You're going to have to have truth as part of your defense and as part of your offense. You want to reach people with the truth. You don't want to trick. We, we had a lady once attended our church and she came up and she said, preacher, I got this great idea. I said, what? She said, I think we ought to advertise a concert. I said, really? And she said, yeah. I said, well what would we do? And she said, well, I think we want to have, start with the old 50s rock and roll. I said, really? And then as we go, we'll start switching over so it turns into a gospel concert. I said, so you want to trick people? That's not the way we operate as Christians. We want to be truthful with them right up front. Hey, we're going to invite you to a rock concert that's going to turn into gospel. People are going to say, forget that. They don't want to be tricked. And you can't trick anybody into receiving Jesus Christ. You can only reach them with the truth. And so having our loins gird about with truth means that that truth, when it's talking about the loins, it's talking about your, your stamina and your ability to keep going and keep going and keep going. And if you don't have the truth, you're not going to go very far. And if you aren't truthful with people, you're not going to go very far. You're just not going to, it's not going to happen. You're, you're just going to have to, to, to be right up front with them about what the Bible says for them. What the Bible says for them. What God's plan is for them. So having your loins girt about with truth. And then it says having on the breastplate of righteousness. Where are all your vital organs? Right in here. Right there. And they have to be protected. Now everybody's heard stories of pastors who have fallen given in to sin and they've fallen for, for whatever reason. Maybe it was financial, maybe it was sexual, maybe it was anything like that, but they've fallen. And that breastplate of righteousness is to protect your most vital area. In other words, as a Christian, we have to live in a way that the righteousness of God is displayed within us. That we follow after the righteousness of God. In other words, when we talk about being Christians, being like Christ, we should be striving for that every day. We should be striving for his righteousness. Just because I'm never going to be as perfect as Christ until I come into his kingdom doesn't mean I can't start working on it today. And there's a lot of people have an attitude, well, I'm saved. Uh, one of these days I'll get around to living right. You, you just can't do that. 
that righteousness, that breastplate of righteousness is there for our protection. And the enemy looks for the weakest spot to attack. And when we let the righteousness of our life start to slip, we just give the devil open targets to hit us. Having on uh, the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Every once in a while, I have to take a pair of boots or a pair of shoes and have them repaired. Because they get worn down. And if I'm going to continue to go forward with those shoes or boots, I'm going to have to do something to make repairs on them. Well, when he's talking about having our feet shod, he's talking about having ourselves prepared to go to whatever distance or whatever length that we need to do. When, when you have a horse, if you're planning on any kind of a long ride or maybe a trip with your horses and stuff, then you make sure that they got on new shoes before you take off. Because you don't want to be out in the middle of nowhere and the shoes wear out on you. Then, then it's a job to go ahead and have to fit shoes and make that horse, uh, prepare that horse to continue on the journey. And God wants us to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That means that we are prepared to take the gospel wherever we need to take it. We, we've already prepared. We're ready to go the distance whatever it takes, because our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We're, we're ready to take it wherever the world needs it, wherever we need to go. We've prepared ahead of time to be ready to take it. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, the old time armor, there were gaps in that armor. And the shield was used to protect yourself in your other vulnerable spots. And when it says to quench the fiery darts of the devil, what that means is you put the fire out to quench them. And when the old devil's shooting his fiery darts at us, and he does it all the time, it, it doesn't matter where we're from, what we do. It, it doesn't matter what our occupation is. If you're a Christian, Satan is going to fire darts at you. He's going to do everything he can to cripple you up. Now, what's the purpose? He knows as well as you do that he can never have you in his kingdom below. If, if I know Jesus Christ is my Savior, I'm going to heaven. But he can sure stop other people from going there if he can ruin your testimony. And that's what his attacks are about. His, are attacks, his attacks are designed to make you fail so that your testimony before others will be damaged. So you won't have the influence on other people that God wants you to have. And that shield of faith, that's where we're trusting God and saying, look, I'm, I'm going to follow you no matter what. I'm going to be your child. I'm going to be your servant. I'm going to be your voice. I'm going to do whatever it takes, Lord. So I'm trusting you to help me fight off those attacks. I'm trusting you to take care of those darts. That's our shield of faith. Our faith and trust in Christ says, devil, you cannot win against me. You might hit me once in a while with a little dart, but I've already won the battle. Amen. And I'm going to walk like a victorious Christian. I'm going to keep my testimony intact. And I'm going to, by faith, trust God to help me in that. So what does that mean? Well, he says he'll never let anything come upon us that we can't handle. And 
what, uh, what does that mean to us? He said he'll always make a way of escape. You know what that way of escape is? It's prayer. I'm going to tell you, it's the hardest thing in the world to sit there and sin while you're praying. So when those temptations hit, we need to hit our knees. When, when the devil starts throwing these darts, we need to say, Lord, here I am. I'm on my knees. I need your help. Here's my shield of faith. You are my shield of faith. And I'm trusting you to help me get through this right now. We get in trouble because we go, yeah, I, I know. I probably shouldn't have had that thought or this or that or the other. But we don't go to the Lord right then. Now, that's the voice of experience. Because we've all done it. We've all failed to take our request to God when we're under attack. Well, it was just a little dart, so I figured I could handle it. That's not using the shield of faith. The faith, faith is there. That shield of faith is for all the darts, whether they're little or whether they're big. And our job is to take that shield of faith and say, here I am, Lord, trusting in you. And I need help right now. The darts are coming my way and I need you to help me through this very, very difficult time that I'm facing right now, this minute. I don't need to wait till I get home to pray. I need to pray right now. Whatever's going on, I need to pray right now. If the old devil's throwing things at you, right now is the time to enjoin the battle. Uh, listen, Satan, <laughs> you know, I'm real busy right now. Could you just wait until later? And he's going, oh, no. If you're not going to bring up your shield of faith, I'm going to hit you with everything I got while you're vulnerable. And so we need to we need to take that shield of faith, our faith and trust in the Lord and use it to quench the fiery darts of the devil. Then in verse 17, it says, and take the helmet of salvation. Do you know what the number one reason for death in motorcycle accidents is? It's head injuries. That's why they say, wear a helmet. Because... It can save your life because a blow to the head can kill anybody pretty easily. And if not kill them, it can impair them to the point they may never be right again. And so when we're talking about the helmet of salvation, we're putting on that helmet of salvation and we use that to protect our mind. Here's how that works. I know I'm a Christian in my mind, in my heart. But I know how, how, how do I justify the fact that I say I know I'm going to heaven because in my mind, I know I've read the scriptures. I've done everything that God told me I needed to do to be saved. So that's the rationality of it, that your your mind needs to be protected. So when you've got on that helmet of salvation, it means I'm not going to pull this off. I, I'm not going to pull this off to go into this place where I shouldn't be or to speak to this person I shouldn't be around alone. Any of those things. I'm not going to take that off because that opens up the door for Satan to just imp impale us with all those darts. That helmet of salvation says to me, my head is protected because I know where I'm going. Doesn't matter whether I feel like it, because I'm telling you right up front, sometimes when those darts hit, one of his biggest darts is doubt. You, you need to understand that. Just if he can hit you with that little dart that says, yeah, you're not really a Christian. Are you sure? Do you really think God would forgive you? Just to implant that doubt in there. 
And so we've got to make sure that we keep our minds stayed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We do that with the helmet of salvation, knowing that I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven. And because of that, I need to act like it. I'm in an army. I'm in God's army. And I need to act like a soldier of God. And I need to take advantage of all the protections that he offers me. I was riding for the for Trace Biotis Ranch once, and I wasn't paying much attention. There's some cow tracks going along here, and I wound around a couple of these Ocotillo cactus, and I went, oh my goodness, those cows can walk right under there. But sitting up eight feet in the air on that horse, I can't. I can't turn around. The horse, there's no way he can turn here. I can imagine what's going to happen if I try to back him and he hits one of those cactus. We're going to have a real rodeo. So I, I can see the other side. It's just right there. So I had to be doing this, pushing the cactus out of the way. And I'm going, man, I wish I had a pair of gloves. Man, I wish I had a leather jacket on. Man, there's a lot of things I wish right now because it, it's painful. Well, Satan's darts are painful. And if we're not going to take advantage of the, the uh, armor that God has given us, we're just inviting an attack by the enemy. Said so to take the helmet of salvation... And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In all this armor, the only thing that's an offensive weapon is the sword. Everything else is for our defense. But the sword is an offensive weapon. And it says that the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. When Satan came and met Jesus up on the mountain of temptation, uh, how, did, how did Jesus deal with him? Through the Word. Through the Word. When Satan said, hey, you know, you can throw yourself down from here. And even the angels are supposed to, to uh, keep your foot unless you dash it against a stone. Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. We're not to do stupid things going, well, God will protect me. You know why I've never been bungee jumping? <laughs> For one thing, they don't have any bungees big enough. <laughs> Secondly, I'm going, how stupid to jump off that bridge and going down going, God will protect me. God will protect me. And then you're in heaven and God says, I told you not to do that. You know. Why are you here? Because you did something stupid. I don't bungee jump. I'm not going to jump out of an airplane unless it's going to crash. I never could see the, the, the logic in jumping out of a good airplane. If, if I'm not crashing... I'm staying where I am. Huh? I'm not going to jump out there. It's, it's just, to me, it's foolishness. And as Christians, we have to be very, very careful that we don't do foolish things with the notion, well, God said he'd take care of me. Yeah, but he also said, use your head. You know, don't tempt. Don't try me in such a way that you do something so stupid. Now, trusting in him when we need to is what we're supposed to do. And we're supposed to trust him and try him and prove him. Lord, I'm going to jump off this barn roof and I expect you to catch me. And he's going, what kind of an idiot's going to do something like that? I, I just... I, I just think that we need to make sure that, that we're not doing foolish things. But when we look at this sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, He says, listen, if you're going to fight Satan, do it through me. That's your only chance 
of victory. Satan is just below God in his power. He's way above me in his power. I do not have what it takes to try and stand against Satan alone. So I take the word and it destroys every argument that Satan puts out there. It'll do it every time. But if you're going to use the word, you better know it. Amen. You better know it. You better know what the Bible says. I, I, when, when David was going out to face Goliath and, and uh, King Saul said, here, put my armor on. And, you know, he's just, I don't think I can do this. I haven't tried this. I've never used this. It, it, now I'm just going to trust God because he's given me a weapon I need to finish that giant. I don't need the armor that, that, that's the king's. I've never proven that armor. And so the way he's going to defeat that giant is the way he defeated the lion and the way he defeated the bear because he's trusting in God because of his protection and the way he's done it in the past. And so when we take the word of God, uh, we can't just do that in a willy-nilly fashion and, and just blurt out a scripture. We better know what the scripture means. And we need to know what it's there for. And we need to know the context of it and why God gave that scripture to us. And we don't get that just sitting there going as we read the Bible. We need to try and get some understanding. Now, your pastor's here, and I know him very well. He's one of my oldest living friends. He must be good because he hasn't tried to kill me yet. But the fact is that, that I know him. I know his heart and I know his desire. And his desire is to prepare you for battle. His desire is to give you the weapon that you need. And that weapon is this book. So when we have Sunday school and we have church and the pastor's preaching and teaches, he's doing that for your benefit. That's his job is to prepare you. So we need to take advantage of every opportunity to learn what the word of God has for us and how we can use that for our own defense and for that offensive weapon that is more powerful than the devil. He cannot stand against the word of God. He can't. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. We need to understand that God has a purpose for us. And in that purpose, he gives us the defense that we need through the armor. And he gives us the offense we need through his word. And that's all we need. We can go to battle surrounded in God's protection and in his word. Finally, it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So he's saying, look here. If you're going to go into battle, you better go in prayerfully. If you're going to face the wiles of the devil, you better be prayed up. You, you better be ready and constantly in prayer for what God might have for you that day. Which means I need to face each morning with a prayer saying, God, prepare me for the day. I don't know what's coming. You, you never know what's coming. My brother Dan died several years back in a motorcycle crash. And I went to church that morning. The last thing on my mind, Dan was in his 50s. The last thing on my mind was to hear that day that my brother was dead. 
So we don't know what we're going to face with each day. We, we don't know. When my dad died, he, my dad had been very sick and we were anticipating getting the call. All those things we, we were prepared for. But sometimes the old devil hits us when we're not prepared. And the only way we can stand and make it in those circumstances is to be prayed up. Now that was a crushing blow to me that day. My brother Dan was not only my brother, but Dan and I were best friends. That was a crushing blow. And there's only one way I got through that. It was by the grace of God. Because it was a hard, hard day. Very hard. When we're looking to persevere, to stand during the attack and against the, the wiles of the devil, we have to do that by being prepared in our person. We need to have the armor. We need to have the weapons. And we need to uh, have that uh, constant attitude of prayer. Now, I, I know I can't pray every second of every day because I'm going to have my mind on some other things that I have to have my mind on. But what it's talking about is having a constant attitude of prayer. I'm ready to pray as each need arises. Ready to go to God first. We don't always do that. We try to bear up. Sometimes we just need to say, Lord, here it goes again. I'm facing another dart. I need your help. Be constantly ready to go to the Lord in prayer. Now, the one thing if you noticed in here, there was no protection for the back. No protection for the back. Why? Because we're always to face the devil and to face the challenges that he puts before us. Trusting in God and taking uh, his armor to ourself that we might be able to continue to go forward. The old devil, uh, nothing he likes better than to see a Christian turn and try to run from him because now he's got an open target. We need, just need to stand. Lord, I, I don't know how I can stand. You're going to stand not in your power, but in mine. You're going to stand not because you are the power here, but because all your armor and all your weapon comes from me. I'm the one that's going to help you. I'm the one that's going to help you to stand during this difficult time. In your lifetime, you're going to go through a lot of different things. However, you're never alone. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that a comfort? And to, to be honest with you, Jesus makes himself our armor bearer. He said, here, you need the breastplate right now. You need the helmet right now. Here it is. I've got it for you. And he's just waiting for us to say, Lord, I want you to clothe me with your armor. Arm me with your word that I might be able to make a difference in this life. This morning we were talking in Sunday school about eternal life. You know, everybody's going to live forever. Some, some are going to live forever to God. Some are going to die forever. Can you imagine in the throes of death for eternity? But God doesn't want us to live that way. We have the victory in Jesus Christ and he wants us to live like victor victorious soldiers. He wants us to march into the enemy's camp with our heads held high, covered with his armor, and ready to face whatever the devil throws at us. And we can, simply through our faith and trust in him and following what his word says. On my 30th birthday, Leah planned a big surprise birthday party for me. We were in Springfield, Missouri. And she enlisted the help of our friend and pastor, Cecil Talbert. And she said, I need you to keep Rick busy while we're getting everything ready. 
So he said, I got some visits to make. And so I want you to go visit with me. I said, okay. So we start down the road and I said, where are we going? Well, we're going to brother so-and-so's house. I said, well, you know, back there's a way to go. I know a shortcut. And we wandered around and everything and I'm going, what is wrong with him? I mean, we'd have been there 15 minutes ago if he'd gone that way. So we finally get there. And we get finished and we're going to go somewhere else. And he said, now we're going to go see so-and-so. So I said, we want to turn here. And he just keeps going. By now, and I'm still dumber than the post. I haven't figured anything out. That, that is the only time in our life that she was able to really surprise me. <laughs> but I'm going, what is wrong with him? I mean... There's a right way to go and get this done. But he's going off over here on these back roads and stuff. I'm going, what are you doing? You know, I'm so gullible. He took me to a Western shirt and bought a shirt that would fit me, not him, that he was buying for himself. <laughs> Had me pick out a shirt for him. I said, well, Cecil, so that one won't fit you. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure where it was my own gift. <sighs> But by then, I was so frustrated by everything he was doing with all these back roads. Whatever, you know. And sometimes we get that whatever attitude when we ought to be saying, Lord, I'm going to follow your instructions. I'm going to go your way. I'm going to do what you want me to do. Because that is the only way I'm going to be victorious. So I need to surrender myself to him. I need to take that whole armor and apply it. And use it to fight off those fiery darts of the devil. Make sure that I am doing everything that God asked me to do. And then you know what I do? Take that shield of faith and say, okay, Lord, I'm following you. I'm doing what you commanded. So it's your turn. You just keep me shielded. You keep me going in the right direction. And you give me the ability I need to use that sword. So let me ask you, you don't have to raise your hands. Have you ever faced a trial that you felt like, boy, the old devil is after me today? All of us, all of us have faced those trials. What'd you do about it? Did it drive you to your knees or did you try to muddle through or did you just go, oh, this can't last forever. I'm just going to keep pushing and pushing against. Or did you say, Lord, I can't win this battle. I can't win this battle on my own. So I'm going to let you direct me. I'm going to let you show me the way. And I'm going to let you protect me. And whatever the outcome, I'm going to trust that it's according to your will. Sometimes the Lord lets the devil do some things to us because he has a bigger plan that I can't see. And I have to come to that point where I'm willing to trust him. I'm going to put on my armor. I'm going to take up my sword and I'm going to take up my shield and say, I'm ready, Lord. Now I'm going to give it to you and let you direct me. And that takes a surrendered heart to say, Lord, whatever happens, I want you to be the one in control. I'm ready to go to battle. I've got everything on. But you're the one that needs to lead me. You're the one that needs to take and make this a victorious outcome. Because I can't do it on my own. It's up to you. Let's stand our feet. We're going to turn to 331. 331, room at the cross for you. And I want you to just think for a minute. You know, the song says, though millions have come, there's still room for one. The Lord's telling you, just come to me tonight. If you're here and you've never trusted Christ as Savior, you've never made that decision, this is your chance. There's room to come. 
If you're here and you're a Christian, you may be going through some things. You know, I actually heard a guy say once, oh, the Lord's got more things to worry about than me. I'm sorry. We have a God that can worry about everything at once. You included. You may be facing something that you just say, Lord, I need your strength and your protection and your help to get through this battle. And you just come tonight and say, Lord, here I am. Help me to do what I need to do and trust you to do your part and lay it in your hands. As we sing, if God speaks to your heart and you need to come, you come tonight. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which I can hide and it's great and this is your opportunity. If you just need to get alone with him, this is your opportunity to do that. The hand of my Savior is strong. song. Boy, you just don't sing it that much anymore. And boy, I just some, well, my heart's in the old songs anyway. They preach pretty good, don't they? <laughs> All right. We want to thank everybody for being here tonight. And trust the Lord to bless you for being in his house. Uh, keep your pastor in your prayers and uh, just add, ask God to keep strengthening him day by day by day. And uh, we look, look forward to seeing him back in the pul pulpit on Sunday morning and Sunday night. So we'll, we'll just look forward to that. In the meantime, keep him in your prayers. Remember all your other folks that have been mentioned that need prayer and, and keep them in your prayer throughout the week. And then start thinking right now, what am I going to do the next time Satan starts throwing darts at me? What am I going to, what's the first thing I'm going to do? What's the first thing? Coulter, you remember what the first thing to do? To pray. That's it. To pray. 
And we, we, we got to get in the habit of just going to God right now. Every chance, every opportunity, every situation. That is our first line of defense. Because we can go to him and say, Lord, I'm ready for my armor. Start putting it on. I need it. And that's where we need to be. All right. We thank you for being here again. Look forward to seeing you. I think we're going to be up next Sunday night for the sing. So we'll look forward to that. And, and uh, I think Coulter's going to sing with Leah and me next Sunday night too. Yeah. yeah. I told him we were going to start singing and then just quit. And he'd have to do a solo. But, <laughs> but we probably wouldn't do that to him. So remember those things that are coming up. Remember these folks in prayer. And we'll trust God will bless you this week for your attendance here today. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Pastor, you feel like praying for dismissing? Sure. Yeah. Father, I do thank you again for the truth of your word that will, will make us free. We know, Lord, that you have prepared us. Uh, as the pastor said, um, there's, there's no armor on the backside of us. Uh, that's because the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Amen. We take you by your word and continue charging uh, against sin in our life and in this world. And I pray you find us being those type of Christians this week as we march with you into victory. And I pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.